Hello, everybody. Welcome to our innovation rally here at the Idea Center at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, my name is Brian Ritchie, and I'm the Associate Provost and Vice President for Innovation here at the University. And uh, please come on in. We have plenty of room up front here as well. Uh, plenty of chairs, so don't stand along the back. Come on up front. Uh, we won't laugh at you for being late. I'm uh, glad you're here. Uh, it's a little light today inside. Uh, this whole COVID thing has made things weird. We're running a hybrid event, but we have well over 100 people online as well. So we've got people in the room and people online, and hopefully we can uh, uh, get some great uh, presentations here and have a, have a great uh, conversation. We're really pleased today to have invited the Purdue contingent, Riley from the foundation, and we also have Paul and Jay, Vivek and Andy here who are going to do some presentations for us for some companies, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here to lose tomorrow and uh, thankful that you could be a part of what we're doing. And uh, we always invite uh, uh, friends here to have a beat down tomorrow. No, just kidding. Um, but I will say this, guys, remember what I said the last time we got together that uh, uh, we've never lost a game at home that we've had one of these innovation rallies. And last week, they needed every bit of the innovation rally. Is that not true? So true. Yeah, so true. Thanks for carrying the day. We appreciate all of your hard work and everything you did to make that win possible. I was sweating it out there for a minute, but there in the very end, you guys all came through. So I appreciate that. Uh, Purdue will be a little bit of a tougher challenge tomorrow, but I still think we got this. So that's the good news. Um, so for those of you that don't know about the Idea Center, I'll just give you a quick background really quickly. We're the innovation, entrepreneurship, commercialization arm of the University of Notre Dame. Uh, we create companies, we de-risk companies, uh, we work with students, faculty, community, alums, uh, in ways that add value to innovations and ideas. Ironically, we're called the Idea Center. We really don't come up with any ideas. We, we're, we're, more the, we're more the fuel genius kind of guys, we uh, and gals. We, we push things through, we help people find the resources they need. Uh, to do interesting things with the ideas that they have. Uh, with, the, with the university, the community alums, we've started about 150 plus companies over the last four years. Uh, we run a $25 million investment fund uh, that uh, we've put into about 34 companies. Some of you may have seen some of the announcements recently of companies that we've recently funded like SimbaChain, uh, Cobamba, VitalView, uh, a number of really interesting technologies that have received funding. Uh, that we've been a part of that as well. You'll see some great technologies today. Uh, these are technologies that we're also working on and, and working to get funded. And I know that at Purdue, they're also doing really interesting things. In fact, we often say that of the universities in this area, frankly, in the United States, that think about commercialization like we do, Purdue is, is one of those that does. So we appreciate their cooperation and friendship and uh, partnership in a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, for those joining online, uh, we'd ask that you ask your questions via the Q&A feature in Zoom. So if you'll just do that in the Q&A, we'll make sure that we get those. If you put it in chat, we may miss it. So make sure it's in Q&A. It will then be transferred over to Slido. For those of you that are in the room, uh, download this if you haven't already. Use the QR code, get Slido. You can ask the questions. They will appear on the screen. We're going to take them right off the screen. Uh, and unless they don't make sense, we'll probably take them pretty much in order. So. Uh, make sure that you have that. So um, let me just give you a quick outline of the structure really fast. These are going to be very short, hard-hitting presentations, five-minute presentations, five minutes for questions and answer. We don't think we're going to get to all of the questions or answer all of the issues. It's more to just spawn the discussion, get us started, and we hope that after we're finished that you'll either come up and engage with the presenters, or if you're online, you can email and contact, and hopefully we can follow up with additional questions or or um, uh, things that you'd like to talk about later. And so with that, we're going to, we've got six presentations. We're gonna start first of all with Novolytic. So we're going to invite Paul Dreyer from Purdue to come up and make the first presentations. Give a big round for Paul. Test, test, test. All right, super, thank you. Thank you very much this afternoon. Thank you to Notre Dame for inviting me on uh, maybe not as welcome grounds because I am coming presenting uh, for Purdue, but go, go Purdue. And, 
Uh, seriously, Purdue has been a great supporter for, for us. Uh, I've been involved with them as a mentor and in, uh, in their entrepreneurial school for a number, uh, number of years. And without them, I wouldn't be up here, nor would our company have the growth that we have already. So thanks, everybody. <clears throat> My company, Novolytic, we develop technologies and analytics that make drugs safer and make uh, medical devices work a lot better. We're going to start talking about drugs. Um, Sorry, guys, it won't be about cannabis this week. <laughs> really, actually, what we're going to focus on is monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies are really cool drugs. They save lives. They're the drugs that go into your uh, body, like hum Humira. You guys ever hear of that before? Humira is pretty cool. It's a great, great arthri arthritis drug. Um, Lilies, don't ask me to pronounce it, but it's like <laughs> that's what they shoot in you when you get COVID and go into the hospital. It saves your life. And there's a whole bunch of those out there, and they're made in bioreactors. Bioreactors actually are just really fermenters, just like what you brew, brew beer in, kind of like the picture I almost have over there. And uh, that's my, bo my bottle of beer on the right. Um, it takes 14 days to make these drugs. And, <clears throat> excuse me, as a matter of fact, they're act not made in a beer fermenter. It's something a little bit more um, high tech, and there's a picture of one there. And it's a great big giant market. It's growing in some cases as much as 1,000% a year, depending on the drug you look at. And uh, it re represents just last year, 1.4, or excuse me, $144 billion worth of drugs are sold a year. There's a problem though. There's actually two problems. The first one deals with the FDA. The FDA wants people monitoring those drugs when you're manufacturing them all the time. And the problem is, is that Big Pharma can't do that. The current analytics that are out there in the market, uh, it takes them about eight hours minimum, usually as much as 14 hours to tell you what's going on inside of that reactor. That's a problem because the FDA doesn't like it. There's a bigger problem and it's a great big cost problem because they can't monitor those things in real time. It costs them 60 to 80% of the cost of goods sold just to purify the drugs so that we can take them and get saved. So that's a big, big cost. It costs even one day saved is worth $200,000. So wouldn't it be really cool if somebody developed a technology that could do that? Well, we have. And that technology, is everything working okay? Is uh, what I'm showing our prototype instrument here. It's called the proteometer. The proteometer, <clears throat> excuse me, if I can get this to go forward. Houston, we have a problem. Uh, that one, that's perfect. There we go, thank you. So do I get the extra time here? <laughs> All right, product features. We do do continuous monitoring and we do it in the reactor. You don't have to take a sample out, go over to the QC lab and solve that problem. It gives you the data that the FDA is requesting that you submit, showing that that reactor was in control for the whole 14 days that you're manufacturing it. More importantly, if something goes wrong, instead of waiting 14 hours for it, we tell you automatically. There's been a big benefits. Uh, you reduce that contamination, therefore your cost of goods sold become um, much lower, your profits much higher. Uh, we shorten the purification process. And basically, for every reactor, we could save a minimum of about a million dollars a year. That's a big, big benefit. You know, when you think about those canaries that were in the uh, coal mines, we kind of like to think that we look inside that reactor and look for the poisons that are in it. So that makes us the canary in the fermenter. So it's a big opportunity for us too. Um, currently, there are about 5,000 uh, reactors in the, market, in the marketplace. Um, each reactor, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at the value of a proteometer and the consumable stream that comes uh, from uh, our products, that correlates to about a $500 million total available market. How do we calculate that? Proteometer will market for about $85,000 a piece. More importantly, the yearly income from con consumables is as much as $100,000. So how do we beat our competition? We have a really unfair advantage. I mentioned already that we beat people up with time. We beat them up um, on the ability to 
tell whether those defects are in there very quickly. And the reason we can do that, it kind of relates to a car. If you were low on white, white washer fluid, would you do like our competition does? They tear apart the entire molecule to figure out whether or not um, they're short on windshield wiper fluid. We, on the other hand, we're like the dashboard. We tell you immediately what's going on. So how do we fit in the competition? We're focusing on that identity, that control, looking for those defects, and we're focusing on the FDA. <clears throat> Everybody else that's out there, they're focused on either research or doing something in the QC lab that takes eight to 14 hours to go through. More importantly, these big companies, Thermo Fisher, Agilent, Waters, uh, AB Sciex, they, have a, they will be the companies that will, will purchase Novolytic because we can do what they cannot do. In short, because of our consumables focus, we'll also make them a hell of a lot more profits. So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it all boils down to a team. We have a great team of scientists and engineers. Uh, we have finished our prototype. We're heading towards pilot testing. And this group of great people are all up in Purdue, yeah, rooting for Purdue for tomorrow. And, <laughs> and we've made some really good action as well. We have the prototype advantages. We've been able to secure 10 patents on our product. Some of those patents did come from Purdue, some from our own laboratories. Um, and we do have uh, some scalability. We have been nominated for three consortium um, uh, evaluations by what's called Nimble. Uh, that's a um, NIH and Big Pharma consortium to evaluate, tell you exactly how they want that technology to work so that when you bring it out in the market, everybody wants it. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we have uh, secured a um, evaluation program with a major uh, CDMO, and we'll start a big uh, pharma pilots in early in 2022. Um, market commitments are to launch next year, and we right now, it looks like we're gonna keep with these promises that we've made here. So that's the end of the presentation. I think that's lesson five. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, Fantastic. Right. Thank you. Damn. So a couple of questions, and we just get, we'll have five minutes here for questions. So have you quantified your cost and FDA strategy for the system and the software as a medical device? What's the strategy going forward? Yeah, very good. Um, so two questions here. One is quantified the, what was the first part? Quantified the? Quantified, uh, the cost. Yes, absolutely. And the FDA strategy for the system. Yeah, and then the FDA strategy is really kind of neat. We do not have to have an FDA approval for our instrument. The pharmaceutical manufacturers, they approve our instrument as part of the, um, the process. So the process to make that drug utilizing our instruments gets approved. Yeah. Our real secret strategy though, is I mentioned Nimble up there. We're also part of another uh, consortium that is called the Emerging Technologies Consortium, the ETC which is comprised of 13 major pharma companies. They submit all their information and data on new technologies to the FDA. It's one of the greatest things our, 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 our government does. And what it does then is the FDA, if they agree with that, they release what's called an FDA impact statement telling everybody it's like the greatest press release you ever had. And it says, hey, this is good technology. We, we, uh, they give the formal, I'm like, oh, <laughs> you're in the right me. place. I'm in the right place, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, you can start praying if you want. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, so is your advantage over the competition based on better software or a new different measurement technique? What's the secret sauce? Yeah. The if secret you can sauce tell us. Is, it's all patented. So you can tell us, right? Yeah, it absolutely <laughs> is. Um, we have four primary um, uh, compositions of matter patents, and then the rest are methods patents. Composition of meth, uh, uh, matter patents are all in new technologies. Um, one of them actually, which is very, very cool, is in a green chemistry for manufacturing. The chemicals that coat our instruments that, that are the sensors that, that test it. And we're doing it for the first time in the history of the world. Everybody else starts with very toxic chemicals to produce uh, those coatings. We start with water and uh, organic materials that are non-toxic. Hmm. Fantastic. This next question is throughput comparison of the proteometer versus bioreactor, but it does, it's not really going through the proteometer, right? The proteometer is just sensing what's in the bioreactor. Is that true? Yeah, that's, that's correct. What yeah. happens is the sample loop takes very, yeah. very tiny uh, samples. And I'm talking out of the bioreactor. Out of the reactor. The proteometer. Yeah, less than 100 microliters of sample are needed to be able to, to do the, the analysis. Interesting. Fantastic. 
What is the technology basis for the device? How are the measurements? I think we just talked about that. We just right? talked just about that. Yeah, it's um, if people maybe they understand some of the technology. A big portion of our technology is through new advances in what's called chromatography. Our uh, uh, chief science officer, officer is Dr. Fred Rainier. He is uh, one of the top 20 analytical scientists in the world. Notre, uh, Notre Dame has two and Purdue has two, so that's a tie game. <laughs> <laughs> but truly there is a rating system for these, these really, really smart people. And there are four wow. of them right here in the state of Indiana. It's something wow. we should all be proud of. Absolutely. And Dr. Rainier developed those, it's chromatography and a new technology called MASK, which is mobile affinity sorbent chromatography. So a little bit different than normal chromatography. Fantastic. Other questions in the group here? Anything else? Nick, any other questions? All right, well, good. Let's give another round. Thanks, Thank Paul. You. Okay, next we're going to hear from Ryan Biggs, who's going to give us a presentation on Hello From. This is a Notre Dame technology. Take it away, Ryan. Not a bioreactor company. <laughs> You are one of the top four in what you do, right? In the world, is that in true? the world? Yeah, there you go. I don't think we have any competition at Purdue. All right, everybody can hear me? Oh, yeah. Thank you. The beer and the mask, I sweat over there. Um, so, yeah, I'm Ryan Biggs, I'm the founder of Hello From. I am curious, who in this room has received or purchased a greeting card in the past year? Wow, okay, that's great. You're gonna love this presentation. You good, Conway? Maybe not. We got a dance to get to the end day. Nope, we're good. So if you purchased the card this year, you probably went through this painful experience. You might've been late for the occasion, you figured out you had to drive to the store, stand in the miles and aisles of greeting cards for 20 to 30 minutes, feeling like you're wasting your time, frustrated, you couldn't figure out what to say in the card, and then you realized you didn't have a stamp and you had to run back out to the post office. Have people felt this? Yeah? Good. <laughs> you're gonna love what HelloFrom is then. This was Blockbuster in 2004. It was at its peak when it was beating Netflix, and Blockbuster had $5 billion in annual revenue. Fun fact, 2004 was also the last time Purdue beat Notre Dame in South Bend. <laughs> Blockbuster isn't coming back to beat Netflix and Purdue is not gonna beat Notre Dame tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Sim similar to Blockbuster in 2004, Hallmark currently has $5 billion in total revenue. Also like Blockbuster, Hallmark is failing to evolve with its customers. Competition is focused on customization and shopping. Customization, you go on and build your card, you're working for your product. Shopping, you're either searching in the miles and miles of greeting cards or you're scrolling endlessly to find the perfect card. HelloFrom, with its recommendation engine, wants to remove all of that work forever. It all starts by adding your closest friends and family. We first ask for some basic info. From here, it's all about the relationship. We wanna know how close you are with that person, What's the tone of that relationship? Is it funny? Is it heartfelt? Is there any religious affiliation? And then we want to dive into the interests and hobbies of that person. Are they a cat lover, a dog lover, wine, whiskey, beer, healthy eating, travel? We want to know everything. From there, we're going to ask you what occasions you want to connect with them on. And then we take care of the rest. Our recommendation engine is going to show you a personalized selection of greeting cards for every occasion. So that one minute of work takes care of all that headache forever. Gotta have the video. And then once you select one, we'll put that card on your doorstep one week before the occasion. You hear me? All right. So we're moving very fast. Q1 of this year, we validated our concept and built our MVP. In the first month, we onboarded over 100 users and now have B2B pilot partners we have 300K invested with a strong team. Again, my name is Ryan Biggs. I have a background in corporate innovation at Nike and Vans. I built my own on-demand printing and manufacturing company, and I'm now working at the Idea Center. Ellie is a rock star UX UI designer. Charlie 
has designed and developed products for a variety of different startups. And Anthony, with his experience at Amazon's Audible, is going to help us expedite our build process. Some of our advisors include Lindsay, who's head of brand at Ring Doorbell, Dan, who led sales at Minted, who I actually met in New York City at the National Stationery Show, and Evan Ray, who's a friend of the Idea Center and a serial entrepreneur. Social media is causing depression and unhealthy habits, making us feel like crap. Research shows that strong relationships lead to ha happier, healthier, longer lives. HelloFrom is a relationships company. We're starting in the seven and a half billion dollar greeting card industry, but we know with our recommendation engine, we can get into so much more, including the $30 billion gifting industry. So we're raising $500,000, 300 of which is already committed, 100 is coming from the Pit Road Fund, and 200 will be closing soon. Netflix uses recommendation engine to disrupt Blockbuster. HelloFrom is going to use its recommendation engine to disrupt Hallmark. Thank you. We should say that uh, this round is filling quickly. If there are investors to talk to us, that would be interesting. Um, okay, do we have questions? Yes, yeah, so you said to, you put the card on my doorstep. Did you mean receipt or do I need the stamp and the mail part? Sorry, I should have clarified that. Yeah, yes, no, we provide everything. So we include an extra envelope and a stamp so you don't have to do any of that frustrating work. It's all done for you. So I've used this service. And I will just say the cool part is it shows up on your doorstep so you can write whatever you want to personalize. They've got the envelope and the stamp. You just stick it back out in the mailbox as soon as you're done. Saved my life several times already. <laughs> all right. We don't have other questions up here. Are there other questions? Yeah, go ahead. How much do you charge for a business? It's a great question. So our business model right now is we charge $20 annual fee and $5 per card. So once you figure the gas and the time, it's a great deal. Go ahead. Currently, we're not selling any information. We don't plan to at all. Um, it's, it's mostly focused on using our algorithm to figure out what cards are the best from hundreds of designers across the country. And then we have an actual person validate those before sending that to the customer. So in the same way that Netflix uses your information to divine content, the way they go with content, I think it'd be the same way. You should, you should talk about um, plans down the road for content creation. Yeah, so my, I have background in on-demand printing and manufacturing. Uh, we, we actually see a world where we have no inventory in the future. We're, not at, we're working with designers to upload their content to our website. And then once we're curating that content, we'll print, ship, and pack all in one day. So we don't hold any inventory. We end up lowering our cogs down to 30 cents per card. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for that. Other questions? Yes, go ahead. 25K. He asked about minimum investment. Other, yes, go ahead. Currently, we don't. Uh, that is on our roadmap, absolutely. It's part of the raise and part of our next build. So we have some good questions up here too. How does the platform to Hallmark, how does your platform compare to Hallmark's sign and send program? Yeah, so Hallmark, uh, the way they're doing right now is their sign and send program. You still have to go find your card. You've got to go through all that work. What they'll do is you'll, you can type in an information and they'll send it out for you. Through our research, we found that that's kind of a soulless experience. You, know, you don't get to touch and feel. You don't get to handwrite in the card or really reflect on that experience. And then when somebody receives it, they know it went through their sign and send program. And it's, yeah, it's kind of like getting an e-card. No offense to anybody who sends you posts. <laughs> So we have a question, why is the pit road investing in this? Um, I'll just say from our thesis, we always look for disruptors. We look for anything where people can come in and, ex and change the experience. If you've got a large group of people doing something regularly and there's a large pain, then if you can find something that quickly and easily disrupts that in a big way, um, we're very excited about that. I don't know about you, but I was alive in 2004. I remember Blockbuster. I remember going to Blockbuster. I remember never thinking that Blockbuster might not be around in 2010, right? These things happen quickly and they happen in big ways. And if you resonate with the pain, you start to realize there's a big opportunity here in a $7 billion market to change the way we think about this altogether. That's why we're excited about it. Go ahead. Yeah.
So right now we don't have an in-person strategy. Uh, I can say that we do work with boutiques to identify the best cards for all of our customers. So we're actually helping them make money. So as much as you enjoy that experience, we hope that the HelloFrom experience makes that even easier. But, but let me ask this, Ryan, because maybe a follow-on question that you could respond to. It, it feels to me like at some point when you are a content developer that there would be opportunities. Like for someone like me, three options is all that I can think about. That's the, all I got time to think about. That's awesome. And it's good enough. I'm a satisficer buyer, right? But in your case where it's like, I got to have the perfect card. It's got to say the perfect thing in the perfect way. You could imagine an environment where down the road you had the content where online you could shop to create the perfect thing, find the perfect thing, spend as much time diving or double clicking on as many options as you might like might be an option down the road once you have the content that you could provide. Yeah, correct? we haven't we haven't launched it yet, but we're actually building our designer portal where designers and boutique shops can actually upload their own content passively. And then that's going to allow us to increase our supply, which then we can show you more cards at one time. All right, one more. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, technology is there to do that. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, repeat that question. That. Uh, so why can't I just sign it digitally and you sign it for me and send it out? Is that right? We find that, you know, when we think about handwriting a card, it's the same way when people want to journal. We think about it as relationship wellness. So taking a physical object and going through that ritual and doing it yourself actually gives you different endorphins that make you feel better when sending it out. So it's not only for the recipient, it's for that individual who's sending the card as well. <laughs> <laughs> Even technically, though, do you, you might do you think send it's... cards normally? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <It's exactly. laughs> it might be though that you could actually just transfer what you had written. That you actually get the same. You're doing it electronically, and it gets printed on there somehow. Maybe that's an option for you to think about. Okay, let's give uh, Ryan a hand. Thank Thanks, you, Ryan. Fantastic. Okay, uh, we're excited now to have, uh, again, from Purdue, two folks that are going to make a presentation, Jay Shaw and Vivek Ganesh, and they're doing this online, but they were unable to make it, unfortunately, so this will be an online presentation, and we'll turn the time over to Jay and Vivek. Are they on, Nick? Okay. Hey, guys. Can you guys hear me all right? We can. Awesome. Well, we yet. That's coming. Give us That's one. That's coming. All right, all right. We'll give you the high sign. Give us one second. <laughs> Let me get my presentation pulled up. Okay, I think we're good. Go ahead. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jay Shaw, and I co-founded Narava. Um, and we're developing a wearable device for epilepsy patients uh, at risk for sudden unexpected death, or what we call SUDEP, that will save thousands of lives. I'm delighted to be here today to tell you about how the team at Narava is giving back control to patients with uncontrolled epilepsy. So three and a half million Americans and 50 million people worldwide that suffer from epilepsy are at risk for SUDEP. There's currently no device on the market that monitors SUDAP risk. With no available monitoring, parents and caregivers face enormous stress and anxiety as they try to monitor their loved ones. Patients are also given drugs to control their seizures, but for the 35% that do not respond to seizure-reducing drugs, they have to wait an additional one to five months just to enter an epilepsy monitoring unit, or what we call an EMU, to be evaluated, with only two to 4% actually undergoing surgery. Through a discovery of a potential mechanism of action behind SUDEP, Narava is developing the first of its kind SUDEP detection device and artificial intelligence-based algorithm. This patent-pending device is a non-invasive neck wearable that wirelessly monitors four key biological signals associated with SUDEP. We're designing this device to be worn at night while the patient is asleep, since almost all cases of SUDEP occur at night. Our SUDEP detection algorithm uh, uses AI to wirelessly alert a caregiver of potential SUDEP risk allowing for real-time preventative action, such as CPR. Now, as a patient's seizures remain uncontrolled, the risk for SUDEP remains unchecked. 
So not only will our wearable detect an alert for SUDEP risk, it will expedite the treatment process by wirelessly transmitting this recorded data to a primary care team. This will shorten uh, the monitoring unit's inpatient leading time, uh, lead time, leading to shorter wait periods and increased turnover. So currently, there are no devices on the market that monitor SUDEP risk. Epilepsy patients instead use seizure monitoring devices. However, since 26% of SUDEP cases actually occur without a clear preceding seizure, these devices cannot effectively alert for impending SUDEP risk and prevent these deaths. Our wearable uses four sensors to detect seizures, cardiac, and respiratory dysfunctions that are known to occur prior to a SUDEP event. When combined with our understanding of the mechanism of action, we can then determine potential SUDEP risk and alert caregivers to intervene. We, uh, Narava has a PCT patent that's currently pending that covers our technology. We've secured exclusive rights to this technology from Purdue, and future patents filed on the SUDEP de detection algorithm and our sensors will be owned by Narava. So once the neurologist determines that an epilepsy patient needs to go to an EMU, we will sell our device to these patients through physician prescriptions and insurance reimbursements. A smartphone app grants patients uh, access and physicians access to a patient database for which we'll be charging a subscription of $30 per month, in addition to another $30 per month for replaceable electrodes. We plan to charge $1,600 for our device with rebates given to early adopters. Looking at the US market and employing a bottom-up approach, our uh, total market consisting of the three and a half million Americans with epilepsy is $8.4 billion. We plan to enter the market by first targeting the approximately 221,000 patients waiting to enter an epilepsy monitoring unit annually, which would give us a target market of $529 million. We would then begin, uh, we would begin by visiting the uh, epilepsy monitoring units of our clinical advisors. Uh, and beyond epilepsy, our platform technology can also be further expanded to cover patients at risk for sudden infant death syndrome, sleep apnea, and shock. And so over the next year, Narava will validate its full system by conducting human feasibility studies and locking in the design of the device. In the next phase, we'll work together with a third party manufacturer and verify the safety and efficacy of the device before submitting a 510K to the FDA in 2023. By late 2023, we would have received FDA approval for the first version of the device and will go to market by 2024. We've, we've assembled a team with strong engineering and clinical experience to do this. Vivek, my co-founder, is a PhD student in electrical engineering at Purdue and has also previously worked at Apple. I recently received my PhD in electrical engineering at Purdue uh, and I'm now going full-time into Narava. We work closely with our advisors who have a combined 70 years of experience in epilepsy-related medical devices, SUDEP research and epilepsy treatment. Dan Moore, the former board chair at Levanova, also brings massive epilepsy related business experience to our team. We've currently developed prototypes of all of our sensors and have uh, also collected some exciting preclinical pre -clinical data from an epilepsy animal model. We've also hired a team of former FDA reviewers to help us develop our regulatory strategy. And we actually met with the FDA earlier this year through a pre-submission meeting and validated the strategy. We recently closed on our seed round, raising 650K through a well-rounded group of investors consisting of VC firms, angels, the co-founders, and a very important strategic, UCB Biopharma. UCB is a worldwide leader in epilepsy with over $6 billion in revenue in 2020. As a pharma company, they develop uh, important and key anti-seizure medications, and we're excited to be working with them on our pathway to market. So we're seeking an additional 100K, which will help us meet some really important inflection points. These funds will allow us to complete our final prototype, leveraging our partnerships, and also allow us to finalize our insurance reimbursement strategy. We'll collect human data through early feasibility studies in the epilepsy monitoring units of our clinical advisors and expand our team with new hires. And so thank you for being with me today and learning about our plan to help patients with uncontrolled epilepsy take back control of their lives. I'd now like to open the floor for any questions that you guys might have. Let's give Jay a hand. So Jay, I'm just thinking that if this company had some uh, electrical engineering capacity, it'd be really in great shape, right? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, your first question. How much lead time does the device give before su death? Are there preventative interventions you can take or is it post cardiac arrest CPR, the only intervention? Great question. So right now what we're looking at um, is, is within 30 to 45 seconds that we can, when alert happens, so we can, or when, when a dysfunction happens, we can send this alert out for a caregiver to intervene. 
Many times in, in SUDEP, these patients are actually found in the prone position, uh, unable to breathe, and through our mechanism of action, we've realized that, you know, if you can flip them up on the supine position, so on their back and raise them up, you can prevent, you know, the SUDEP. Uh, we're also, you know, CPR is has been shown to be 100% successful if we could administer it uh, within three minutes. So that's what our, our, our plan is. If we can alert it within 30 seconds, a caregiver can come in and, and give CPR. Also, this is just the first version of the device. What we're anticipating is also our lab specializes in therapeutics and implantable devices that can perform stimulation to suppress seizure activity. Um, and so in the future, we are planning on having a therapeutic device as well. We're also looking to partner, you know, we can potentially partner with companies like Levanova or Neurocase that actually do electrical stimulation currently in our FDA approved devices that can suppress seizure activity. And so we're hoping that in the future, we can have a strategic partnership with a company like this or a potential acquisition where they can then use our device as inputs to their system of when to use stimulation to actually prevent these deaths. Uh, Jay, let me just ask you a quick question on the fundraising. You, um, you said that you had raised, have you raised 600 and you're just looking to raise 87? Wow, we're getting some funky visuals here. <laughs> I can uh, put my yeah. slides back up if that no, may no, help. No, you're, but... you're good. I, I don't know why it keeps doing this, but um, tell me, tell me, tell us about your fundraising at this point. Are you, mm -hmm. um, tell us where you are exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we've raised uh, you know, uh, through our pre-seed round, we had won a couple of pitch competitions and raised some money as well. But we actually recently just closed on, uh, had an initial close of 650K uh, through, uh, a, you know, our group of uh, well-rounded investors, UCB, Elevate, uh, another group, a wide variety of investors as well. Uh, we can raise up to 750K. So we're looking for about another additional 100K as part of the, the same terms of this round. Yeah. We can continue to raise on these terms um, for about the next two months as well. So that's what we're looking for right now. About 100K left on these terms. I understand. Okay. Good. Correct. Yep. Look, other questions? Oh, we got some here. Uh, would it also be able to integrate with automated calling of EMTS? That's actually also uh, another great uh, question as well. So we, we've we actually been you know, working with and talking to a potential partnership with a, with a firm called Noonlight. And Noonlight basically would allow us to automatic, uh, like it, we can integrate our system with theirs. And basically what this would do is that when, it, when our system detects um, a seizure or a SUDEP event, it can automatically alert EMS. And so this way, if, if a patient wants that, we can it, incorporate that into their specific desired platform as well. Um, this way, if they want to call EMS, if they live alone, or if their caregivers also want to have EMS be alerted as well, that is also a potential that we're planning on integrating as well. Fantastic. Um, how far will your seed round take you? You talked a little bit about it. Does it get you all the way to the 510K, all the way through FDA, or how far do you go with it? Great question. So our seed round initially will help us finish off building our initial prototype and actually get some really important human data. Um, the next round would be used to finalize the device, do all of the safety and efficacy, efficacy testing that the FDA needs, and then also use those funds to actually submit the 510K. Um, in, in terms of a timeline, our seed round will can comfortably take us for the next year and a half. Um, and we're hoping that by that end of the next year and a half would be then when we'd be doing our series A round to be collecting the funds to do the 510K. Fantastic. We have time for one more question. Any others? All right, let's give it up for Jay. Thanks, Thank Jay. you guys. Thank you guys so much. Okay, uh, we're now going to hear from John Fogelson, who's going to give us a presentation on Granis Therapeutics. John. Thank you. Is there a clicker? Is the old fashioned way? I always do it the old fashioned way. It's fine. <laughs> Hey, welcome everybody. Thanks for having me here today. I'm excited to be here to tell you a little about some of the cool work we're doing at Granis Therapeutics. Um, so Granis Therapeutics is a biotech company uh, based on some technology discovered by two scientists here at the University of Notre Dame, Dr. Brian Blagg and Dr. Senkat Mishra. Um, the overall goal of the company is to take the innovation coming out of Dr. Blagg's lab here at Notre Dame, bring it into the company, seek outside funds to advance it to the early stages of the clinic, and then look to partner um, with biotech or pharma companies to take it through the more capital intensive approval process. Right now we have two programs that we're working on. The first is for the treatment of triple negative breast cancer and bladder cancer. 
And the second one, which is a new program we just started off, is for the treatment of open ankle glaucoma and steroid-induced glaucoma. To date, we've been funded through grants from the NIH and are in the process of raising a $1 million seed round. So I want to take a minute and paint a picture for you guys. Imagine that you, your partner, your sister, your daughter, your friend, are one of the 10,000 women in the US who have been diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer this year. You've gone through that first initial treatment of chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, but your cancers come back and it's spread throughout your body. You've gone through another round of advanced treatment, which is you know, expensive monoclonal antibodies, other targeted therapies, but the cancer continues to grow. Your doctor turns to you and says, the only thing I can do for you is offer you a really difficult chemotherapy regimen, and at best, you have six to 12 months left. Now imagine the doctor has another option, an option for more time, more tears, more laughs, more hugs. That's what Grannis is working to provide. So how do we do this? I'm not a scientist and I don't play one on TV, but I'm gonna to try to give you a little bit of an understanding of how we come about this and some of the great insights that have been developed here at the university. So the focus of the company is on inhibiting specific versions or isoforms of a protein that's called HSP90 or heat shock protein 90. And HSP90 is what's called a chaperone protein. So you can think of it as the chaperone at the party they're, it's there to responsible to bring everybody together, make sure they have a good time, they do what they need to do with inside the body and in the cells, and then they go off and have fun. And this HSK does, does the same thing. However, for and, and tumors specifically and other diseases, the body is continually in this, uh, the cells, are, the tumor cells are continually in this grow and replication phase. And so they get addicted to HSK because they need it to kind of grow and replicate. And so by inhibiting that, you have an op opportunity to prevent cancer growth. And importantly, because there's so many other of these client proteins or the kids at the party that the tumor, that the protein regulates, it has an opportunity to have a combinatorial attack as well as be efficacious in multiple tumor types. Sounds like a great approach. It's not a new approach. Back in the early 2000s, there were 18 plus molecules in clinical development. All the big pharma companies had programs in this area. And unfortunately, none of them were successful and they all failed in late stage clinical trials due to cardiac toxicity, ocular toxicity, and some dosing challenges. Our approach is different. The previous molecules inhibited every type of, all four versions of HSP90 the same. We're focused on inhibiting individual versions. And in this program, it's HSP90 beta. And by selectively inhibiting that version of the protein, we're able to eliminate the cardiac toxicity, the ocular toxicity, and the dosing challenges that the previous molecules experienced in the clinic. And we also are able to deliver on the strong efficacy results um, that they saw as well. And to give you a sense of from an efficacy standpoint, in our early cell studies, we're seeing five to seven-fold increases in efficacy over these previous generations of the, of the molecules. So not only do we have an opportunity to provide an amazing treatment to patients in need, this is also a significant economic endeavor. Uh, are we looking at the late stage, so that kind of post-metastatic last therapy for triple negative breast cancer and bladder cancer? Um, globally, we're forecasting over a billion dollars in peak sales uh, on an annual basis. Drug discovery and development is a long process, and it takes a lot of money. And so what the way we're approaching this in our in kind of our approach and our strategy is doing the early work in the gray and the discovery work at the university bringing those molecules and those assets into the company, doing some additional work inside the company with some NIH funding and some outside capital to get into the point where you're ready to go into the clinic. And that's, uh, you file an application with the FDA that's called an initial drug uh, application or IND. And we're targeting to have that, that work completed in mid 2023. And our current focus is in this preclinical work here where we're looking on, working on testing the molecule in animals, in different animal studies and animal, um, uh, models to see efficacy and safety. So our seed round, we're looking to raise a million dollars. Um, this million dollars is gonna do a couple things. One, it's gonna allow us to do some additional animal testing to prove this safety benefit that we have seen in the early cell models. We're also gonna do some work to make sure we're going after the right tumor types and the right cancers. We can do some scale up and process work. We manufacture uh, material at a larger scale to support some of the future studies as well. And then we need to uh, cover some of our expenses from a staff and an expert standpoint. Now this only gets us a little bit, bit of the ways here, kind of through that first box of that in vivo, 
ADME, DMPK work. And we applied for a grant with the NIH back uh, in early September that we expect to hear back from them on later this year um, for to the tune of $2 million that'll cover the other two boxes there. Now, that grant's not a slam dunk. We're excited about the opportunity. We, we think our program officer is excited about it too. But in the event that we're not successful on the grant, we'll have an opportunity to come back next year and raise a small series to cover that shortfall from the grant. But we'll have the benefit of this additional data that we have now. And as we've been out and talked to sophisticated uh, VC life science investors, they're looking for the data that we're gonna generate here in the short term before they'd be interested in making a major investment. So we'll have the new data ready to go so that we're able to go out and raise that money successfully. And finally, the team, we've got a great team. Uh, the small team over here on the left is the Granis team. I mentioned Dr. Blagg and Dr. Mishra and myself. We've got some academic collaborations um, at the University of Kansas and University of Michigan. And we brought in some uh, additional outside advisors, some deep scientific expertise from big companies like Pfizer to smaller startups that have IPO'd, and then also some business expertise from veteran you know, biotech entrepreneurs as well. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time um, and look forward to continuing the conversation about our company, our science and our seed round. Okay, yeah. So John, we have a couple of questions here. The first one is how does Notre Dame benefit or participate in its contribution? Right, so right now uh, we have a license with the university and they have an equity stake based on that and that goes back to the university. And we're working on uh, we're negotiating a potential term sheet uh, with the idea center and the pit road fund uh, for the seed round. And we're excited about this and looking into leading that round. That's great. Are you looking for subjects who have been through TNBC and a thriver who have tumors to study? At this point in time, no. We're, we're, what we're really looking for at this point in time is people who have been through the disease and it, it's actually progressed to the point where there's no other options. The disease is uncontrollable. Uh, in the clinic, that'll be where the focus is. And right now in the mice, what we're doing is we're looking at the tumors at the very end to see how that works. Um, but this is a, an approach that's gonna address the folks, unfortunately, who haven't had the success rate um, for the, uh, of the initial tr treatments. You probably know this next question better than I. It says yep. where ACT chemo did not work. Correct, yeah. So typical triple negative breast cancer therapy. Up front, um, you'll get radiation therapy. They'll try to shrink the tumor. Oftentimes that's co combined with the chemotherapy and then they do a surgery to try to take the tumor out. The tumor comes back, that's called metastatic disease, which means it's spread to other parts of your body. And that's where they start to get the expensive immunotherapies that are paired with um, some difficult chemotherapy, some paclitaxel and, and some taxanes. We're looking at the patients who are not successful with beating their cancer on that therapy. So beyond that, one other line of therapy down is where our, where our initial focus will be. So this is a good question. Do any of the advisors have firsthand experience with the previous HSP90 trial challenges or failures? Uh, they do actually. So uh, Crystal Masters is one of our business advisors, uh, was one of the co-founders and CEO of Conforma Therapeutics, which had a pan inhibitor for HSP90 back in the early 2000s that sold the Biogen. So he's been down the road before, knows the pitfalls, and I think is excited about the approach to, um, to move forward. We talked to some other folks who've had this, the scars from that first experience. And they all say the exciting thing about this approach is we know there's a drug here. We know this drug, this approach works to treat cancer. We just couldn't get around the issues with the toxicity and the dosing. So from an investment standpoint, this is arguably a lower risk investment to a de novo brand new technology going after a new pathway because you have the efficacy risk as well as the toxicity and the dosing challenges. For us, we know we have efficacy if we can get the toxicity out. So it's really a safety play and improvement on something that's been there before. Fantastic. Uh, I, I, I should say go Irish as well there. That was, that was important. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry, I've been to the left. Yes. So the question is, is a mouth going to answer the cardiac toxicity question? Yeah, so the, what, what, the way you look at the cardiac toxicity question is, you're looking at monitoring the, the QT intervals. And so you can do that in mice. Um, the, there was also some studies out there that are dog studies that have shown the toxicity from the previous pen inhibitors. And so we're we'll looking at potentially doing those too. They're a little bit more expensive to weigh that benefit and risk trade off. Um, but the mouse study should give us the data that we need to be more convinced than we are. We've got you know, cell data and petri dishes right now that says it's good, um, but we'll get the mouse data to help support that. Fantastic. I know there are some other questions. I would invite you to come talk to him as soon as we're after because we're running out of time, if that's okay. I, I'm sorry that we're running out a little bit. So let's give him a hand. Thanks, John. 
Okay, well, we'll now turn the time over to Andy Eibling of Genefis for their presentation. Andy, take it away. Hey everybody, thank you. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm gonna grab some notes here. Um, my name is Andy Eibling. I'm the president and CEO of Genefis. And I'm um, thrilled to be able to be here to talk to you about what we're trying to do. Uh, Genefis is a preclinical stage regenerative medicine company that was founded out of research done at Dr. Sherry Harbin's lab at Purdue University. Uh, myself, I'm a long veteran of the life science industry, spent 25 years at Eli Lilly and Company, time at Covance and Able Injections. I joined Genefis in April of this year. And what we're doing is focused on the grand challenge of regenerative medicine. And that is the ability to restore as closely as possible the appearance, structure, and function of damaged and diseased tissues. This is a bit of a holy grail challenge here. And I can tell you, some of you probably noticed, I have this bandage here, and I will tell you that this healing issue is very personal to me right now. Uh, I had the minor procedure, and I'm, I'm watching the challenge of my body try to heal itself and grow new tissue uh, firsthand. And uh, this is something that, that needs work, and there's a tremendous unmet need. It's impossible to talk about healing without talking about collagen. Collagen's a foundational protein, a foundational structure in our bodies. All tissue is made up of collagen and cells. And that collagen takes on different shapes or, or properties depending on the tissue involved. So skin, uh, cartilage, et cetera. What we've done is our materials have captured the inherent polymerization capabilities of natural collagen. The ability to form these beautiful uh, scaffolds that natural collagen creates that stimulate uh, regeneration. We're applying that in a way that brings versatility to the design of implanted materials for restoration and regeneration. Our materials have a very, very unique mechanism of action, and that is that they support tissue integration without the classic inflammation, scarring, and fibrosis that comes from natural healing as well as um, conventional implanted materials. This is a massive market. In fact, one study that was done out of USC demonstrated that difficult to heal wounds uh, and injuries create a burden on Medicare of over $32 billion a year. Not only the financial challenges to the healthcare system, but for patients and caregivers, for patients that the uh, uh, additional issues can be devastating. So you're talking about uh, a lack of mobility uh, at best, um, amputations, even death, right, that result from injuries that don't heal well. Patients can go septic. Huge, huge challenge. Also tremendous unmet needs. So despite the, the solutions on the market, we see very poor healing outcomes. We see repeat procedures necessary very often and a high incidence of complications. So we believe that Colomers, what we call our product, has the potential to create a new paradigm, different than any other collagen that's on the market today in the surgical and tissue restoration space. So let me talk a little bit about our, our technology. Colomer is a patented collagen protein it's purified from porcine dermis, and it's free from cellular and other immunogenic components. And what you're seeing happen on the right side of the screen here is that polymerization happening in real time. So when our material is brought to physiologic conditions, a scaffold begins to form. And so you're watching that collagen scaffold forming before your eyes. This allows us to insert the material into voids and tissue, fill the void of the tissue, form the scaffold, and then healing can begin. So it prevents the uh, wound from contracting, and it starts to signal to the surrounding tissue to stimulate that regrowth. Um, highly customizable. So we can control the material properties, the strength. We can make soft gels, as you see on the screen. We can also make high strength uh, sheets and everything in between. So if you think of the applications here, in addition to soft tissue, we can, uh, or kind of fatty tissue, breast tissue, for example, we can also uh, create cartilage material, uh, pericardium, all kinds of options here. Uh, but the differentiator, again, is that when it's implanted, it fills the gap, restores the continuity, 
continuity and consistency while supporting site appropriate tissue generation without evoking inflammation or scarring. And we've demonstrated this in multiple preclinical studies across different species, all with consistent results. Our first product will be a soft tissue filler, and it will be uh, targeted for um, breast cancer, lumpectomy, or breast conserving surgery. Breast conserving surgery is um, a growing portion of total breast cancer diagnoses. Unfortunately, breast cancer became the most prevalent cancer in the world recently, uh, outgrowing lung cancer. 2.3 million people were diagnosed with breast cancer in 2020. Roughly half of them will undergo uh, breast conserving surgery or lumpectomy. That percentage is actually a little bit higher in the United States. There's no, there are no approved products right now to fill the surgical cavity. The, the standard of care is that the surgeon closes the wound and allows the body to heal itself. Seromas form. And we've talked to many surgeons, and, and the, the belief is that this is the best approach. As we start to talk to them about our product, though, it's, you start to see the light bulb shift in their heads. If I had a material that could hold that space and could stimulate growth, and what we saw in the preclinical studies is that 16 weeks, the material had completely recellularized, and we saw ducts, glands, and adipose tissue. Amazing. But if we could grab 40% of the market share, which I think is relatively conservative, we're talking about a $1.2 billion annual sale product. That's just for this indication. It doesn't touch any of the other potential applications for columnar, such as orthopedics, so on and so forth. We also intend to pursue a 510K for wound healing as we move towards uh, PMA studies for breast cancer. We're currently raising, our, this is our initial raise, $3.5 million. This is separate uh, from a one, uh, $1.5 million uh, non-dilutive SBIR phase two award, which is pending right now, fingers crossed. Uh, this will let us get to several key regulatory milestones. Uh, we will have initiated our two sub meetings with the agency for a 510K and PMA and a human feasibility study. Uh, we'll be able to build out our GMP manufacturing capacity um, and uh, complete that human feasibility study. This will give us a significant value inflection point uh, that having that human data and a 510K in hand uh, for our second round, which will probably in, be in the neighborhood of $15 million. So we're very excited about this opportunity. This is a product that really can prove, proves to be a game changer based on the preclinical studies and really can create a paradigm shift in how we view healing and surgical reconstruction. So I'm happy to take any questions and appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Andy. I think the first question here, does ESWT complement the columnar solution to accelerate healing? If so, are there partnerships with companies in that domain? Uh, I'm gonna answer a question with a question. ESWT. Well, you got me. Extra segment matrices I'm familiar with, but ESWT. Good question, thank you. Uh, I don't know is the answer to that, but I would guess that, and we have talked to some people, that there are gonna be multiple combination therapy opportunities here, right? So. You know, if, if there are proven therapies that seem to demonstrate success, we're pretty confident that, that we can help that um, and aid in that growth. So anything to make that healing process go faster, and we create this beautiful structure to allow that to occur. Thank so another, you. Another good question here. How would it work with diabetic foot, foot ulcers where the environment has minimal circulation and other factors like MMP inhib inhibition? that prevent tissue generation. Yeah. We actually have some technologies in that space. Too. Yeah, I would tell you diabetic foot ulcers, and, and I'm, like John mentioned, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I work with some really smart people. And uh, diabetic foot, foot ulcers is a huge challenge. And um, we're, we are, I'm gonna say cautiously optimistic. Hmm. So we have um, uh, some investors we're talking to in a couple of weeks that are very, very interested in this market. And um, we're anxious to kind of learn from them because you know, all the preclinical testing and all the clinical testing you can do in healthy patients, right? You don't get to expose your material to these really, really tough wounds and really tough to heal areas. Now, Dr. Harbin is exceptionally optimistic and, and confident here, but, um, but things like that cause give us pause, right? So we think this could be a game changer and, um, you know, we love a challenge and would love to, to give it a shot, but um, it does create some, that's tough tissue, right? Diabetics have, have lots of issues in in the content, and, and that's why diabetic foot ulcers create such challenges. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something we're definitely looking at. Fantastic, all right, thank you very much. Let's give Andy Thanks. a hand, thank you. Okay, for our last presentation, I'd like to invite Anthony Esplin. He's going to come up and talk about Sleep Easy.
Yeah. Yeah. You just swap it back. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think it's just really be built that way. Yeah. Who's from the beginning again? And then just let it lower. All right. Just. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> All right, my name is Anthony Esplin. I'm part of the Sleep Easy team. We're making sleep convenient and comfortable for those with chronic oxygen needs at night. The team consists of myself as COO. We have Milagros Ramirez as our COO, and we have our, our board of advisors. We have Dr. Chris Salvino, who owns and commercializes class one and class two products, uh, all within this, of this oxygen realm. We have Matthew Coroner, who's helped us with some marketing strategy uh, to help scale our growth. And then we have Kevin Connors, who sits on multiple boards of tech medical device startups. And then we have Larry Mastrovich, which has over 30 years in the CPAP industry that's helping us with uh, our, our strategy and what markets to penetrate uh, for this first get-go. So this, this problem that we identified, or I identified, I was uh, living in Utah and as a scientist and uh, had the pleasure of, of meeting this family that their boy refused to wear a nasal cannula. So this nasal cannula is that tube that goes in your nose, around your ears. Um, usually you see people in older, ho older homes that, that need supplemental oxygen. Um, with those that have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, there's an over 40% non-compliance rate. So they flat out refuse their oxygen therapy because they find that wearing a nasal cannula is just so uncomfortable. And if you were to allocate one hour for every person in nursing care facilities that get treated every night to wear their supplemental oxygen, um, that's a $3.1 billion market for those that, that live with supplemental oxygen on a day to day. Um, but that little boy that I was talking about, his name's Carter. You know, he's like every other little boy that likes going to the park. He has, you know, fun with his dog, but he, he doesn't sleep well at night. And because of that, his parents don't sleep well at night. Um, so I, I, at the time, my son was, was two. And so I really ha had empathy for him because I was like, there has to be something out there um, that can help him get a good night's rest. And thus, the uh, oxygen pillow was born. So with our patent pending pillow, we're able to get the oxygen directly through his face without him even realizing the oxygen so that he's receiving his therapy. So not only does Carter get a good night's rest, but his parents get a good night's rest. And, and that makes a world of difference uh, for those that have you know, little kids, let alone have to live with oxygen you know, on a day to day. <clears throat> not only was, were they getting a good night's rest, we were able to collect some data from them. And we were able to show that before his, his night of rest, that blue line at the top, uh, we, or yeah, before the pillow, he, he had an average of 94%, and that blue line at the top is what his oxygen saturation, the percentage of oxygen his blood was after using our pillow. So we were able to raise that by 4%, and the number of drops, which is how many times your oxygen saturation drops throughout the night, went from five, uh, four to five times an hour to zero using our pillow when we were collecting Carter, uh, data with Carter. In terms of like what markets will we go to first, because Carter, you know, Down syndrome is, is not like our targeted market. It was a specific use case. There are very big other markets within the US that have these needs, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, Alzheimer's, acute bronchitis, dementia, as well as home oxygen therapy. Um, so if we were to sell our product as uh, a, consumable, a consumable model where we sell our pillow up front with the replace, replacement pieces, uh, month to month, we're looking at a TAM of $9.7 billion if we sold it to everybody. Obviously, not everyone's going to use it. And so if we just target that 40% of people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we're looking at a size, size of achievable market of $192 million. In terms of what's out there for people, um, this is what, what people have to face if they have to wear oxygen. You have uh, the nasal cannula, uh, which is what the golden standard is. You have tents, which not many people use anymore or you have non-compliance. They would, they would choose to not receive their oxygen therapy um, over wearing a nasal cannula because that tube gets wrapped around their head, they end up taking it off, it rubs the sores in their nose, so then they get nosebleeds. Um, and this is where uh, the Sleep Easy Oxygen Pillow comes in. So we offer 
comfort to get your oxygen at night and still sleep like everybody else does on a pillow. Um, so you know, we've met with local people where, with Alex Home Medical, where they said you know, we've got 6,000 customers that we can sell this product to. Um, and so we're looking to do direct to consumer as well as having a, a B2B uh, side where we would sell directly to institutions such as nursing care facilities that would want this to you know, save pain for nurses as well as for the patients. Um, so this is some of our, our sales and marketing plan and some of the COGS. Um, this needs to be updated, but uh, the COGS for the pillow, it costs us uh, 1166 from our contract manufacturer. Uh, there's a couple dollars in there for the pillowcase as well as $1.50 for, for the pillow. Um, and then we also have uh, a letter of intent from a nursing care facility called Tannabelle Health Services for, for 200 pillows. <clears throat> in terms of our next milestones and what we're working towards, uh, we're finishing up our, our quality management system as well as um, we'll be launching into a raise here soon where we need $300,000. Um, so we'll do a soft launch um, in the next month where we will be doing more online sales. And then at the beginning of the year, we'll be ramping up and hiring the, those key individuals we need to, to scale the business. So thank you, any questions? Okay, first question is, is there data that shows everyone benefits from uh, an improved quality of sleep with more oxygen? T DTC TAM expansion beyond? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I think so. So we've done some initial testing with healthy people, and uh, we had some healthy people sleep with our pillow using uh, Fitbit to track the different metrics. And so what we saw is there was a decrease in people's um, resting heart rate when they used oxygen uh, versus not using oxygen. So in terms of the metrics that, that Fitbit tracks, we were able to see that healthy people, not, not just people that need oxygen, uh, can benefit from, from sleeping with oxygen at night. Fantastic. Do you need a 510K to sell? No. So we are a class one medical device. So in terms of what we need, uh, we just have to get this last little bit of data we need to collect and then uh, do what's called a letter to file. And then we will have enough to be on the market Ready and to sell the pillow. Fantastic. What's the flow rate of the oxygen through the pillow? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, initially, we thought that we were going to be really inefficient because it, it comes to the pillow. Um, and that's what some previous pillows out there um, struggle with. But because we focus on like the orientation of the person, uh, we were able to get, we have, we have one individual that's COPD that he uses his nasal cannula at three liters per minute. And with our pillow, he uses half the flow rate and gets the same um, acceptable range of his oxygen saturation at night. Interesting. Um, oxygen supports combustion. COPD patients like to smoke. Any risk of fires with your product? Yeah, so smoke obviously- Smoke while they sleep? <laughs> yeah, take a puff on the pillow, take a puff, no. Um, Obviously, you're gonna we're gonna put you know labels into the pillow that you you're not allowed to smoke while while using it. That's that's obviously a liability with any oxygen related medical device. Yeah, that seems like a bad outcome. All right, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this pillow, this iteration is is specifically guide or geared toward people that sleep on their side or their stomach. Um, if if you sleep with a nasal cannula, it actually promotes you to sleep on your back. So if you end up moving at all at night, that's when people that tend to take that nasal cannula off. So there's no really uh, alternative from wearing your nasal cannula to you know, uh, receiving your oxygen therapy at night. Uh, one more, go ahead. Yeah, there's, um, we, we've got a number of different iterations we're working through. So this is the first one. Oh, sorry. So she had asked if we made like a cradle pillow so that way you could sleep on your back. Um, so we, we've got a number of, of different iterations that we're working on with the pillow, but this is our first one that we know that works mechanically. And then we're removing, you know, having some other iterations that actually involve like tracking the patient as they sleep. And as they move, we can direct the airflow to get it to them no matter where they're sleeping. Smart pillow. Fantastic. Let's give Anthony a big hand. Um, actually, let's join together and give all of them another big hand. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I, I really, uh, it's a lot of fun to come together and see what's happening at these universities. Some great technologies, great companies, really exciting things going on. And especially in this 
kind of northern Indiana area, I'm really impressed with what's happening from an innovation standpoint and, and from a company formation standpoint. So uh, thank you to our Purdue guests for coming. Um, we hate to do what we're going to do it to you tomorrow, but and it's all this group's fault. They, they're the ones who carry the day, so uh, we're excited about the game tomorrow. No, best of luck. Thanks for coming. Thank you, all of you, for coming. I hope if you have additional questions or you're interested in connecting with these companies for any reason, uh, that you'll come up and engage with them and, and then keep your eye open for future uh, presentations that we'll make for companies as we go down the road. So, again, thank you all for coming. Have a great day. Go Irish! <laughs>